So therefore it is redemption truths. <clears throat> and uh, you know, in the last class we talked about <clears throat> this um, incredible reality of the, really the, the, the surety of all that is ours in Christ. It's not religion, it's not, um, it's not trying to be religious or, it's just finding out the truth of God in Christ. It's, it is discovering something beyond the religious facade. And I, and I don't say that to put anything down, I just know, <clears throat> you know, I just know that my experience with religion before I came to Jesus was not good. It really was not good. Um, and I thought that when I pointed or looked at religion, I thought that was Jesus. I mean, I, that's what I thought until I met Jesus. And then everything changed. Then I really began to understand that it was about life, it was about his life, that it's that uh, my redemption is not just God um, dying just for me because I was so special, but rather to see him in his heart and his selfless giving in the way that he is for all of us and, in, and, and the me that I thought was so special, you know, he calls it the ungodly. You know, he died for the ungodly. You know, that's what Paul calls us. And, um, and that shows a depth of love um, that goes beyond the normal. I mean, when Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend, that was man's love. That's the greatest of man's love. God's love lays down his life for his enemies. You know. <laughs> There's a big difference there, you know. And uh, Paul was an enemy and he understood that. You know, he, he persecuted Christians and all of this. And um, <clears throat> so one of the things that uh, confused me or that made me not really uh, grasp this whole picture of redemption and of God was because I kind of I kind of saw I'm gonna I'm gonna just give you an illustration of what I kind of saw I kind of saw it as two two things there's this there's this dividing line and on one side you can call it Old Testament um, there was this God of wrath. Right. So I would hear stories, you know, Bible stories of, you know, God, you know, just getting upset, and just destroying people and doing all this stuff, you know. And, and, uh, but then, then the New Testament came. And in that, in that picture, you know, I mean, the most obvious scripture, for God so loved the world, for God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so that side was full of love. <clears throat> and... It, it was confusing for me. I mean, because, okay, if Jesus is God's son, he must have rebelled. <laughs> you know what I mean? And kids do that. So and I was a hippie and my parents were alcoholics. So, you know, I'm going to go to drugs and you go to alcohol. <clears throat> you know? And, um, but I couldn't figure out, I mean, it just, something just was messing with me. Why? Why is Jesus appears so loving and God so mean, and and it, and it, and the basic picture that I was getting was that God's just angry and mean and He wants to get to you. And this is my mind, okay. This is, I'm not 
You know, but a lot of people have this kind of view. You know, God's just angry and mean. He wants to get to me and wring my neck. But Jesus steps in between and says, no, we're going to start being nice now. <laughs> you know. And uh, first of all, what are you doing correcting your father? You need to be submissive. <laughs> Right, all right. Now let me erase this. I'll leave the line there in the middle. And I'll, this is, this is going to be very simplistic, okay? Very simplistic, but it's, it's trying to get the point across for the, for the beginning of these truths. And that is, okay, this, this is a picture of God. <clears throat> Did it all right. Um, and you remember the dividing line? I'm just going to re reduce the size of it, but it's good. the dividing line now is going through the middle of God. And on one side <clears throat> is uh, this word that can also cause us problems, but maybe not, and that's the word righteousness. I'll just put right for short. Righteousness. <clears throat> but on the other side is love. All right. Now we know that if, if, if this were a, a more adequate picture of God, there would be so many pieces of the pie that are describing God's many varied aspects and attributes and all of this stuff. And he's just got all this stuff going on because he's God. He's so far beyond us. What can we know? But we can, but we can sort of begin to know those things, although studying all of those subjects of, of omniscience and all that, that's not really knowing the Lord. That's knowing his attributes, but it's not knowing him. It's not knowing his nature. <clears throat> and his nature, you know, moves in different places within that pie. So we, right now we've got the pie, we've got God divided into two parts, and that is righteousness and love. <clears throat> and on one side, and this is the side that scares everybody, but you have to realize God came up with his own remedy, but I'll, I'll give you the scary side first, okay? Anybody like scary movies here? <clears throat> well, I'm giving you your scary movie for the night. Then. And that is that on God's righteous side, he is against sin, and he hates sin, and he has something within him, but we're only talking this side right now. And remember, he has more varied parts than just two. God's not just made up of two parts. But we're just describing these two. And, he, and, and when there's sin, he has to punish it because he's just, and he's, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? He's just, and he's right, and, and all of that stuff. But on this other side, He's love and he's forgiving and he wants to, you know, he wants to meet your need and he wants to cover you and he's not out to get you. So you say, well, God's schizophrenic. <laughs> you know, like I said, I'm schizophrenic and so am I. <laughs> anyway, so he's, you know, he's got, it, it looks it looks like he's schizophrenic because he's, you know, at one point you see him, you know, you know, see Jesus gathering little children, you know. He goes, come on, let the little children come into me. And he, he walks into the temple and he, ah, and he drives, ah. you, you know what I mean? I mean, it's just like, uh, and I've had, I've had people that I've talked to him about his self-giving nature, about love, and they said, well, <laughs> He ain't always that way because, uh, you know, he drove the money changers out and stuff like that, you know. He didn't drive those money changers out for the reasons we think he did. Right. Some of you have heard me share on it, and God blew my mind with the, what he showed me. But it's, a, it's, everything is not at face value. Everything must be spirit taught. Yeah, if you can just read it, then you probably did, you know what I mean? It, 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 there is a literal meaning, yes. But we need the Holy Spirit, and we want the Holy Spirit. And we want, the, what I'm talking about now is we want the Holy Spirit to teach us Christ and Christ and Him crucified. Okay. So you got these two parts working, and um, he's, he's got this righteous 
side and he makes, you know, uh, two tables of stone, you know, with Ten Commandments on it. And, you know, anybody ever see the, the movie, The Ten Commandments, you know? And, you know, I mean, you know, with Charlton Heston, you know, and it's, it's great. You know, every time God shows up, his hair gets a little more gray, you know what I mean? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> God showed up a few times. <laughs> I don't think that's how that works, but nonetheless, um, you know, and the, and the moment that Charlton Heston is receiving the Ten Commandments, it's like this fire comes down from God and it goes, shh, oh, bam, and it hits that rock and goes, ah, and this voice goes, thou shalt not steal, and he's going, ah, you know, and it's just like, what? Well, what kind of God am I serving here? Can, can I check? Is there anybody else up there? You know? <laughs> yeah, <I'm trying. clears throat> but it's all not understanding the way that God is, the, na the parts of his being that relate to these different things. Okay. So, uh, let's see. I'm not reading anything. <clears throat> All right, well, Adam and Eve, of course, they sinned, okay? So immediately, God's going to be dealing with them from this side, from the righteousness side, and he's going to be dealing with them about sin, but they're still in the middle of that. I mean, he, he casts them out of the garden, right? But he also clothes them, which relates to sacrifice, because at that time, they, nobody was eating animals, did you know that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Adam's going, well, what do I do? Hey, there's a squirrel. I think I'll eat him. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> God said eat freely of the garden, and, and he didn't say just eat any old animal. You can name it and claim it. <laughs> 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 but at the same time, at the same moment that he's having to deal with sin and deal with their situation, he covers them and he clothes them and, and uh, there's, you're seeing something else at work there. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're seeing two things at work there, all right? And uh, so, uh, you know, what, what does the scripture say um, to Adam? In the day that you eat, you shall surely die, and the soul that sinneth, he shall die. And it released this plague called the Adamic nature into God's people. And now, what is in his face all the time is flesh. Okay. Now remember, this story ends well. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I'll tell you what, repentance don't mean much until you see the, the dark side, you know what I mean? <laughs> until you see that you have already went over to the dark side <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> you know. And so, so um, let's see. Let me make sure I got this. Um, so we, we've all failed in this area of righteousness by breaking God's law. Wrongdoing deserves punishment. And God's righteousness requires that payment to be made to satisfy his sense of justice and his responsibility to, to uphold what is right. Man can do nothing to redeem himself, yet we're under obligation to right the wrong or pay with eternal death for Man to appear before God and admit sins means our condemnation is just. You see, if you, if you just go before God without Christ and <laughs> you admit your sins, you better run, but you can't hide. Oh, my God. Can anybody say thank you for Jesus? And that's the key. See, that's the real key. That's the... That's the glorious key, not just some religious teaching, not just some 
uh, uh, fictional superhero 2,000 years ago, but, the, but an actual heart of a person called Jesus Christ and what he did and why he did it. Okay, <clears throat> we're not fully there yet. All right, so here's God's dilemma then. All this has caused God a great dilemma. God is a God of love too. Based on his love, he would send no one to hell. I mean, I've heard that. I've, I've heard people say, how could a God of love send somebody to hell? Anybody ever heard that before? How could a God of love send people to hell? God's love never sent anybody to hell. It was his righteousness. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to someone, they went. <laughs> All right, so um, First John 1, 5 says that God's nature is one is of love and light. That if we walk in the light as he is in the light, okay. <clears throat> light relates to the righteous side of his nature that shines into darkness and exposes it. Okay, light or righteousness isn't trying to be mean. And, you know, we go like this, God just wants to expose me. You know, no, but don't get around him without Jesus. Because <laughs> it does expose you. There's no question about it. The wonder of Jesus is you can keep getting closer, see more and more of your problems, and still go towards him because the one who is, what does the scripture say in Habakkuk or whatever, he that, he that, uh, sorry? Yeah, I was thinking of the one where he, he that smites us both heals us. Yeah, yeah. And what'd you say, Isaiah? <coughs> what'd you say, Doug? Is Doug still on there? Well, I've had technical difficulties all day, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm just blessed to be here tonight, honestly. I'm just blessed to be here. All right, so, so light relates to his righteous side, but, he's, but he also has, a, has love, amen? But he also has righteousness, okay? And that righteousness exposes the things that are wrong in us, and that's why we need his love to go to the cross and deal with this in a proper way. Okay, in a proper way. In other words, it's not just a fictional story that God, one day, he just said, you know, I'm going to send my son down there and he's going to do this and, and you're just supposed to believe it. Some of y'all didn't know God talked like a Texan, did you? <laughs> You're just supposed to believe this. <clears throat> um, no, there's, there's, there's actual reality behind this. And you began to see that it wasn't just God, uh, the God of the Old Testament it was just mean, but somehow he got nice. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Um, as light, in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. That's 1 John 5. One five through six. <clears throat> Even though God's love suffers long and puts no demands like light does, God is still a righteous God. Sin must be judged. I've, I've heard. Let's see. <clears throat> um, God's, however, a re, however, rejecting that love will result in judgment. And so this is one reason why we want to share the real Jesus with people. Because if they reject his love, man, there's no, there is no remedy for that. There's no remedy for that. <clears throat> because his love bought and paid for all of it. <clears throat> all right, so he wants to save us, but number one, he can't ignore sin. And number two, he can't overlook punishment for sin. Now remember, this is going somewhere, and he does deal with these things. He desires to forgive, but his nature won't allow uncondemned sin. It must be judged. Holiness and love are both part of the nature of God. If holiness is broken, love and affection cannot take away wrath and the need for judgment. God is in opposition to sin. He, is, he as holy, must call for the destruction of sin and evil. 
He is just in demonstrating his wrath under these conditions. One attribute of God's nature cannot override or conflict with another. Meaning, you know, he, he, he can't go, you know, uh, he's, he's doing pretty good and then we walk by and all this righteousness comes up and he goes, I'm, I'm going to get you, you know, and all of a sudden his love goes, no, now be kind. Sounds like a husband and wife, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, now calm down. <clears throat> and, and, and say, no, just forgive them. His righteousness can't just forgive them. I, I hope you all are seeing that. It, it, he can't, his love side can't rise up and say, well, just, just forget, act like it never happened. It did happen. <laughs> you know. Wasn't even three days out and Adam already sinned. <clears throat> he, he wouldn't do that, but I'm just <laughs> trying to make a point. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, 23 through 26 goes to great lengths to stress the maintaining of God's righteousness in it all. While most people today are seeking an explanation of how a God of love can punish sin, uh, oh yeah, this was another one of those statements that when the Lord began to you know, show me this. I begin to try to put it down in words. While most people today are seeking an explanation of how a God of love can punish sin, Paul finds it to be an amazing thing that a holy God can forgive sinful people without destroying them. You know, they're going, how can a God, you know, a God of, you know, love punish sin? Paul's go, doing just the opposite. He's going, I am amazed that a righteous God can forgive and not destroy us. <laughs> Isn't it weird? A lot of our opinions of this have to do with our own personal well-being, what we get out of it personally. It's a, it's a self-centered sort of thing, you know. But Paul was looking at this from God's side. Amen. He's going, man, you, you need to shut your mouth and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So this is God's dilemma. How can he show love to sinning people and still be righteous, right? The question is not if God is willing to reach out to help helpless sinners. He really loves us and wants to do what man cannot do for himself, but he must do it in such a way that his methods stand the scrutiny of man, of Satan, and most importantly, himself. See, because God is, God, you know, let's just look at it like light. God is light in that sense. If he does one thing out of whack, then the light goes out in God. So he has to, it's just this, he has to be true to his nature. You know, this has to be true. <clears throat> All right. Um, so you begin to realize then we deserve punishment, okay? Remember, Jesus took our punishment, but we deserve punishment. You and I were born with a heredit heredity or nature towards sin. We're not holy. Let me look around. No, we're not. <clears throat> if all Jesus can do is tell us to be holy and act right, then the gospel is a message of despair. Absolutely. Jesus just coming to tell us to act right. That's a, well, in the old days we'd say that's a bummer. Every summer. That's the way we'd go on and see. She laughed because she remembers the full thing. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Um, there has to be more to this than just the righteous side of the issue. What about God's love? Yes, okay, but here we go. Yes, but a criminal cannot be set free just because the, ju the judge loves the offender and knows the crime was influenced by some other evil person. You want me to read it again? I'd like to find it. Yes, but a, a criminal cannot be set free 
just because the judge loves the offender and knows the crime was influenced by some other evil person. If he sets him free and ignores the crime, though the judge's actions were motivated by love, yet it wouldn't be just and righteous. Other criminals would expect the same treatment, a treatment that ignores sin and crime. That makes sense? I mean, even in a court of law, that makes sense. You know. <clears throat> So when we, when we, and that's just a shadow of the truth. So when we look at God, we go, okay, there has to be something substantial, something real that we can get hold in these issues and not just say, well, why doesn't God just forgive everybody? Or you see what I mean? Yeah. We must find the true way of redemption as, as seen from God's perspective and not just seen from our perspective. Justice demands that you not ignore the penalty, but that the person suffer for his crime or a substitute be provided. Glory to God. Certainly justice cannot be ignored, so before God could act in love, his righteousness needed to be settled. Got it. He has to do it all. This is, this is basically the first couple of four chapters of Romans. He needed to maintain his righteousness, and he did so in doing it this way also. Not just his love side, but his righteousness. <clears throat> Before God could pour out grace, justice had to be satisfied. God could not rightly let criminals off the hook. <clears throat> God's government does not excuse sin. The reason why God can't just do away with hell is because righteousness demands that evil be punished. He doesn't want us in hell. God is not forced to be righteous by others, but his character is such that he must be righteous within himself and toward himself. God is determined to uphold his righteousness, which is upholding his kingdom and government. All violations are a great crime. Conviction is a recognition of the righteousness of God and his law and our own guilt and violation. That's what conviction is. If, if none of what I've just shared were true of God, then there would never be any conviction. We'd just be, there'd just be anger at God. But something within us knows that we deserve punishment. We've done wrong. And that we need to get right with God on some level. That's a good thing. Yeah. You, know, it's like, you know, it's like putting your hand on a hot stove and burning it for the first time. You go, what? Oh, that hurt. And you go, well, that's a good lesson for you. You go, that hurt. It, you know, and you go, uh, you'll never do that again. And you don't, pretty much, you know, most of us. <laughs> Because God puts these things within us. Even, see, even that, that's, that's a fear, but that's a healthy fear. I mean, do you understand that? To, to put your hand on a stove, <clears throat> you, you fear doing that, but it's a healthy fear. It's a protective fear. It's something that's for your good. There are fears that are not good. But God puts a, a, a certain fear in us and a certain thing within us that says, oh, uh-oh. And another word for a lot of times in the Bible when it says the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge or whatever <clears throat> is a healthy respect yeah. for hot stoves. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> it's, it's yeah. And you know what? Here's the amazing thing. Every time you go in the kitchen and the stove is hot, Mama doesn't have to say, oh, stay away from that stove. Don't touch that stove. Or, well, you know, after a while, you know your kid's got enough sense now. Yeah. You know. Well, how come that's not true in the Lord? <laughs> well, we get it and we go, well, you don't need to say anything. I ain't going <laughs> to. All right. <clears throat> Where was I? <clears throat> Okay, two kinds of justice. Um, <clears throat> we see two kinds of justice mentioned in the Bible. 
One kind is found in the Old Testament, and the other is found in the New Testament. They're based on two different kinds of dealing with criminals or sinners. Can we, can we just call you criminals? Because <laughs> God, as judge, is having to deal with criminals, violating the law. <clears throat> All right. Uh, one is based on punishment and the other on correction. Punishment simply pays back in kind for what was done wrong. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, I mean, that kind of justice, we think it was, well, that's a good idea, but that kind of justice, you know, because we're fallen creatures, an eye for an eye, pretty soon everybody's going to be blind. I mean, that's where that ends up. <laughs> And toothless. <laughs> but you wouldn't notice because you're blind. <laughs> so there's, you know, silver lining in all of this. <laughs> all right, so, but um, punishment just simply pays back in kind. And I... Then and I, okay. But the goal of correction is not punishment, but to de deter first. If disobedience occurs, then it corrects the behavior, not just punishes the action. Now, this is, this is important for parents. I mean, this is so important that it's not about punishing the action. It's about correcting and bringing them into the Lord in these realities. You can say, okay, you did wrong, blah, 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 blah. Okay, well then you're, you know. Uh, anybody ever see a long time ago there was a show on, it was, a not, it was a Judge Judy type show, but it was called Texas Justice. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Texas Justice is a little different, okay. We'll kill you. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and and you know to to you know to raise your kids in Texas justice to raise your kids under the law is not not going to be good for them. You know, I mean to raise them in Christ and in the realities of Christ. You know, with our kids, I mean I'm sure Nisi remembers this. We just, we say, look, that's not the Lord. We didn't say that's wrong. You know, and when they were growing up and stuff like that, when they did something good and I was really pleased, I didn't say, good girl. I'd say, big girl, you're growing up, you know. And, it, it, you know, you may think it doesn't have an influence on kids. I think it has a big influence on kids because then they're not always mindful of, uh, they're, not, they're not motivated by fear first are being good, and if you do it right, if you do it right, then they'll want it to be Jesus. They'll want Jesus, and that will be their, their need. And that won't be looked at as, you're messed up, you need Jesus. I mean, because if that's the case, that's all of us. That's right. We're all messed up and need Jesus, and that's a fact. But, but most of us that know that don't look at that like, oh, I can't believe I'm such a bad person. I'm messed up and need Jesus. That's not our attitude, is it? I hope that's not. <laughs> I hope it's, you know, I'm messed up, but thank God I got Jesus and I need him. I'm going after him with all my heart. <clears throat> Praise God. All right, so... Um, God wants to change the hearts of men and reserves punishment for later, meaning those who don't succumb to chastisement. Chastisement or correction is meant to deter and is different than punishment. All right. The Old Testament kind of justice uses punishment as its basis. It treats everyone according to their character, meaning where you're at, where you're formed, and where you're at at that moment. It operates... Uh, its main consideration is reward or penalty. If you do the, the crime, you do the time. Guess where I learned that? <clears throat> it regards only the law. There can be no exceptions to the rule under this kind of justice. 
This Old Testament view is the way many see God today. In other words, this is the way they see God today. Now, we haven't got into the, the, the remedy yet, but you know the remedy or you probably wouldn't be sitting here. You'd be running out screaming. And the remedy is the, the living Christ and the crucified Christ and all that was in his heart toward us, not just fixing a bad situation. He fixed the bad situation, but it says, love crucified him, doesn't it, basically? Love crucified him, not righteousness. Isn't that great? Yes. I mean, it, it's, t it's cluing us into God beyond the veil. It's cluing us into a God, the way, the true way of God beyond what we just see in the outer court or what we see in the Old Testament. And it's allowing us to view the depth of his being and not just his actions. Okay? <clears throat> um, but he no longer operates that way. The main reason he doesn't is because the Old Testament method was ineffective. You see, punishment never removes guilt. Punishment never removes guilt. You can punish a kid for doing something wrong and he still feels the guilt. Nothing has really been remedied. I mean, you know, like with my kids, man, when they do something wrong, we'd pray and get forgiveness too. You know what I mean? So the guilt would be gone. So they're, they're not, But punishment says da-da-da-da. And if you just punish without following up in the Lord, they're still bearing guilt. And... and Shouldn't we be sensitive to that, seeing how we all have been under guilt so many times and had to bear it before we got it remedied by what? Christ and the cross. <clears throat> all right, so um, let's see. You see, punishment never removes guilt. A person cannot suffer to a point where they are no longer guilty. In other words, you can't whip them to a certain place. You know, and then all of a sudden, you hit a point and they go, oh, ding, I'm good. <laughs> I'm not guilty anymore. Everything's good. I crossed over. <laughs> it doesn't happen through punishment. <clears throat> Once you sin, you're guilty. Suffering for what you did does not remove what you did. Right? Suffering for what you did doesn't remove what you did. Um, some think that God brings bad things into our lives to punish us for our sins. You hear me talk about this all the time. You'll, you'll continue to do so. Because so many people have a wrong concept of God now. They, they still live in, under the old covenant. And he's not putting stuff on you to punish you for your sins. In fact... In fact, love is still motivating him to get you to him, to move you to him, to bring you in. That's, you know, just like the, the father of the prodigal son. Does he look like he's standing there with a belt or, you know, whatever, you know, and going, you know, come on, son, get a little closer. We need to wrap this business up. That's what I was, that's what I grew up with. But not our father. Not our father. He runs to him, throws his arm around him, kisses him. The son hasn't even repented yet. Puts a ring on him, the signet ring of the family. You've got all the rights. He sees him as the son that was dead but is now alive. He sees him in Christ. What a, what a beautiful picture that the Lord would give to us of the Father's heart. Because you see, this is where it gets confusing. Jesus, like Hebrews says, Jesus is the expressed image, the express image, the expressed image of the Father. You go, it doesn't seem like that to me. You see what I mean? If you're going back by Old Testament, you go, uh, you know, then he's fixing to turn any moment. <laughs> but actually, he's showing us the true, because 
You know, God is righteous. Can I get amen? God is righteous. But that's an attribute of God. What God is in, in essence is love. God is love. He's a righteous God, but God is love. Ultimately, that defines him, and love found a way through righteousness to bring us in. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. <clears throat> so, the... the the beauty of, of these things is <clears throat> that if we really begin to see them afresh by the Holy Spirit, you know, how is, how is God ever going to return us to the joy of our salvation unless we see the beauty of it again? And maybe even in greater ways, ever-expanding ways. Because if it's of God, it's beyond our little pea brain already. Whatever we got ain't enough, you know. But only a hunger and a deep desire for the Lord will cause us to press through the crowd and touch the hem of his garment. And then what's in him will come into us. See? And everybody else in that crowd, you know, they're all trying to touch him, going, oh, I touched Jesus. I'll never wash my hand again. You remember all those people were around him. They're all in there and touching him and everything. And this little old woman, man, there was something that wanted more than just healing. Yes. And she pressed through, and when she touched the hem of it, that was all, man. I mean, she didn't even get into his face. Mm -hmm. She didn't see the brightness. She just touched the hem of his garment, and what was in him, and that's, what it, that's the way it's worded there. What was in him went out of him into her. Virtue. Well, the end result of that was healing, but virtue didn't say healing. Healing went out of him. Glory. And everybody's talking, woo, glory. Healing. I'm for it. I'm ready. <laughs> but if it doesn't come, I'll take virtue. And I am getting that. Even, even now, even this very moment, but I have been in my alone time with the Lord, and it's wonderful. I mean, I'd rather stay there. You know, but then when that happened, Jesus, who is just going along, in other words, there's something, it's not like Jesus has to be looking around like this, walking in the crowd, going, well, is it him, is it that one over there, is it this one, you know, what's going on? He's about his business, and somebody comes up behind and touches him, and this happens because they touched him in the right way. Yes. It was a way that drew out the reality that's Christ into another human being. And he says, who touched me? He doesn't even know. It's not like, well, I died for you. Sorry, I sound like Bill Clinton. <laughs> I could go on, but I'm not. We're time short. <laughs> I could do some more Bill Clinton. But, <clears throat> but he says, who touched me? And Peter's response is, what is the matter with you? Look at this crowd. Everybody's touching you. Don't you get it? Don't you see this? People are touching you all over the place. You know? What are you talking about? Who touched me? And Jesus knows a reality that Peter doesn't know. It's not religion. It's not playing at God. It's not fooling around. It's someone that could care less about religion that said, this guy is such, this Jesus is such, that if I just touch the very lowest part on him it's going to change my life <laughs> bingo <laughs> she got it she got it and Peter who's been following Jesus now for I don't know how long at that point is still wondering what's going on <clears throat> still trying to figure it out 
still going by the natural. Everybody's touching you. Da 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 da. And 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 this little old woman deep within her being, she knows. Look, I'm I'm talking about something different. You know, if they had this conversation before she ever got there, arguing with Peter, Peter go, well, a lot of people touching him. You know, don't think anything necessarily is going to happen. But, which, you know, there are, <laughs> there are people that are that way. They encourage your faith a lot. <laughs> you know, but go ahead, give it a shot. You know, but that's not her heart. She's just, she's just, you know, she doesn't know everything Peter knows. She just knows, I'm viewing him different than you're viewing him, Peter. I'm, I see this guy as so wonderful and so real that even the slightest movement towards him is going to just rearrange everything in my being. That's, that's, that's her view of Jesus. That's her view of Jesus. Bingo. It happens. All right. Well, we got kids that are going to have to go to school and stuff like that. Father, we just love you. And Lord, we don't want to be, we don't want to be wrapped up in scrambled eggs, everything all being all scrambled up. We just, we want, we want light and life and love and reality. We want it all coming through. We don't want to say no to light and righteousness, but yes to love. We, we want the whole reality of you, Jesus, because the way that you did it, because of your love, has made it all safe. And the extreme that you went to, Jesus, to do that for us, so that we could be one with you because you did love us and you do love us. And you you didn't just save us, you brought us in to be your bride. What what words could we ever say? What what things could we say except thank you? And we just ask, Father, that you allow the Holy Spirit to let this luminescent one, this Christ, shine greater and brighter at the path of the righteous, the path of the righteous. It's like the noonday sun. It gets brighter and brighter, not until we burn up, but until a new day, until a new day. Bring us into the new day in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.